Hey guys, how are you? In this video, we're going to visit Kuala Lumpur. We're going to look at the major sites of the city, talk to locals, try some local food, and visit the local party scene. You ready? Let's go! Welcome to Kuala Lumpur! Kuala Lumpur is the capital of Malaysia, a country in Southeast Asia. Did you guys know that Malaysia is composed of two regions? East Malaysia, which is on the island of Borneo, and West Malaysia, which is on the Malay Peninsula. And this is where Kuala Lumpur is located. Kuala Lumpur is one of the three federal territories. It's one of the fastest growing cities in Asia with a population of 2 million people and 7.5 million people living in Greater Kuala Lumpur metro area, also known as the Klan Valley. My first impression was, wow, it really reminds me of Singapore. I guess it would have been the other way around had I visited Kuala Lumpur first. Those same rain trees, skyscrapers, monorail trains and many other similarities. It's hard to believe that some 200 years ago, this metropolis did not exist. Let's take a short look at the history. The town was first developed around 1857 when a member of Selangor's royal family, Raja Abdullah, hired 87 Chinese prospectors to establish new tin mines. They found the perfect location at the intersection of the Gombak and Klan rivers, which explains the name of the city. Kuala Lumpur literally means a muddy confluence. From 1874, Malaysia was under British rule, and its rapid growth thereafter has been attributed to Sir Frank Swettenham, British resident who initiated construction of the Klan Kuala Lumpur Railway. In 1896, the city became the capital of the newly formed Federated Malay States. During the Second World War, the city was occupied by the Japanese. And in 1957, Kuala Lumpur became the capital of the Independent Federation of Malaya and of Malaysia in 1963. All right, back to the modern day. Most visitors go to stay in KLCC, which stands for Kuala Lumpur City Center. It's a dynamic high-rise downtown area known for upscale shopping malls, restaurants and hotels with rooftop swimming pools. I'm on one of the rooftops in Kuala Lumpur and it seems like the city gives you so much for so little. I'm paying just $28 a night for this room and you get this beautiful, absolutely gorgeous rooftop with a swimming pool, infinity swimming pool that you can see in all different directions. So I got this room for $28. Can you believe that? Just $28 a night and this is what I got. I was surprised how affordable everything is. And that's what I first thought. Kuala Lumpur makes luxury affordable. Wow. Welcome to Kuala Lumpur. <laughs> Man. But it hasn't always been this way. This is what Kuala Lumpur cityscape looked like in the 1980s before KLCC was created. <laughs> KLCC district was designed to be a city within a city. The 100-acre site hosts the tallest twin towers in the world. The Petronas Towers, an iconic symbol of Malaysian development. 452 meters tall. From 1998 to 2003, they were officially the tallest buildings in the world. They were designed by Argentinian-American architect Cesar Pelli, who also designed World Financial Center in New York City and Salesforce Tower in San Francisco. There's a sky bridge linking the two towers between the 41st and 42nd floors. You can take a guided tour and the ticket price is just $21. That's a great deal. Right now I'm on the sky bridge, 170 meters above the ground, and I'm between the twin towers. Tower number one and tower number two. And I'm between them. The KLCC Park is a nice addition to the towers. Overlooked by skyscrapers, the park offers walking paths and musical fountains. Kids are sure enjoying it. KLCC Park, your nature getaway in the middle of this gigantic metropolis. What is the best way to get around town? When you arrive at Kuala Lumpur International Airport, the most convenient way to get to the city is to take a high-speed train. The airport is 60 kilometers away, so going by car it might be a long ride depending on the time of the day. The city traffic can get pretty busy even though the city has an extensive network of multi-lane roads and express highways. Mopeds and motorcycles are popular too. The city has a comprehensive network of buses, taxis, monorail and light rail transit. KL Central is the main transportation hub. 
The monorail runs directly through the city center, with the LRT lines branching off connecting various suburbs to the city center. The MRT along with the commuter rail lines run over long distances connecting Kuala Lumpur with surrounding towns. The LRT has a daily ridership of 500,000 people. A single ride goes between 19 cents to $1.90 depending on the distance. For visitors, a sightseeing bus is actually a pretty good option. It will circle around the major sites and it goes every 30 minutes. Very convenient. And it's not that expensive. Just $19 for 48 hours. If you want to use taxi, Grab is a great app. Is it difficult to be driving in Kuala Lumpur? Mm, not really. <laughs> I see the roads are in great condition. Yeah. All right, let's visit some interesting places. Merdeka Square, or Independence Square, is one of the most popular places in the city. It was formerly used as the cricket field of the Selangor Club. It was here that the first Malaysian flag was raised to mark the country's independence from the British rule on August 31st, 1957. Since then, the Independence Square has been the usual venue for the annual Independence Day Parade. There are lots of historic buildings, like the Sultan Abdul Samad building. It was built in 1897 under the British colonial administration. I'm at the Independence Square in Kuala Lumpur, very popular spot, and you might wonder, independence from whom? Well, independence from the British, which they got in 1957. Oh, uh, Remace, you want to explain what's going on? So right now is the month of Ramadan, so Muslims fast from sunrise to basically sunset. And they do that to kind of remember God and become more self-conscious about their actions and their decisions. Um, so yeah, right now we're about to have sunset and they're, everybody's about to break their fast. So you see a whole bunch of people with water, with snacks, but nobody's breaking their meal yet. So Tourism plays an important role in the city's service-driven economy. KL was the sixth most visited city in the world in 2019. No wonder, you're basically getting Singapore Dubai experience for a third of the price. Many large worldwide hotel chains have a presence in the city, but one of the oldest hotels is Hotel Majestic, built in 1932. When it comes to demographics, Kuala Lumpur is comprised of three major ethnic groups. That is Malay people, 46%, then Chinese people, 43%, and finally Indians, 10.5%. And right now, we're in this little district called Little India. Let's visit Little India, or Brickfields District, that's the official name. Residents have lived in this quarter for generations, making it the largest and oldest enclave in Malaysia, with Indians, Sri Lankans and Bangladeshis calling this neighborhood home. Today it's quickly becoming a property hotspot because of its proximity to Kuala Lumpur's prime transport hub, KL Central. Is this Little India? Little India. Wonderful. Where's a good place to eat? Yeah. This one. We are in Little India and I ordered something that's really popular here and that is a banana leaf. Alright, this is the banana leaf that I just ordered and it's just, there's no meat, it's just vegetables. Okay. Hello sir, masala chai. <laughs> Next, let's visit Chinatown, a bustling area with street food vendors and shops. Huan Yin, Huan Yin, which in Chinese Mandarin means welcome. And I welcome you to Chinatown of Kuala Lumpur. This place is just busy all the time. People come here to try some Chinese cuisine and get some counterfeit goods. You know, if you want to appear wealthier than you are, you might want to buy some fake brand products like watches and clothing. And so that's why people come here. I made friends with a local Chinese guy, Duncan. I just asked him one question and he ended up showing me around all over Chinatown. This is one of the best, the, the best Chinese, Chinese delicacy. So what do you recommend? I'll recommend this. The thick rice noodle with uh, the caramel thick. 
uh, take soy sauce and they just cook with the um, the, sea the seafood. You see the prawns, uh, the squeeze, everything. And how trimmer? Okay. So I'll be having Hokkien yeah. Mee, okay, yeah. and this is thick rice noodle with some caramel. seafood and caramel sauce. Yeah, caramel. Let's have a try. And how to? Very good. Very good. Very good. It's crazy rain outside. Yeah. We're just in the rain. I can't believe it. Today, we're in the these guys just came from mainland China and they say it's the same dish they have in China. There was a heavy rain and at this time of the year it rains daily because the time around March and April is the main monsoon season. The climate is hot and humid overall and you can expect rains at any time of the year. Chinatown is not the only Chinese district in the city. Duncan took me to his neighborhood, Kapong, which is also predominantly Chinese. Oh, Duncan, explain where we are. It's Kapong, is somewhere where I'm staying right here, right right now. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm staying for and almost... You call it a Chinese village? Previously, yes. Okay. It was a village, and now it become a small town. Okay, this is uh, the central of uh, Kapong here. The place that I truly recommend is called uh, Gaga Bakute. Ba means uh, meat. Okay, good. It direct translate, uh, direct translate means bone, and te means uh, tea. Bakute. So this is a combination of the dish. It will serve later. It will serve later. They will serve later. They will serve Which later. Which one of these dishes are we gonna try? Okay, these two. This, these are the famous. These are the famous. Before the shop opened, they will prepare the broth. Uh, came with the bones, with the pork, uh, the, the meats, everything. They will just simmer for a couple of hours, couple of hours, and become like that. And then they will cook in the in the sing, uh, the small pot, one single pot, and simmer it for a few minutes. Yes, We're gonna be eating some bakute. Show me how you do it. The mesh garlic and also yeah cherry pepper. You love spicy? Yeah. The, the soy sauce. Caramel, caramel. Caramel sauce. Yeah, caramel okay. sauce. And what kind of meat is that? Uh, pork. Pork this meat. Pork meat. Okay. Yeah, pork, meat, pork meat. And this and is pork, safe. so it's served with caramel. Um, dark caramel. Dark caramel, okay. Yeah. Okay, this is what people do in the evening in Kampong, which is a district in Kuala Lumpur. I've noticed there are a lot of visitors from China. Hello, how are you? I'm really well, how are you? I'm doing good, what's your name? I'm Austin. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you. Where are you come from? I'm from China, Shanghai. Oh, okay. Yeah. And what's your first impression of Kuala Lumpur? Um, so Kuala Lumpur, I feel like it's a kind of modern and old-fashioned city. I can see the old street, old block like, like here, but still they have like very modern, fancy buildings as well. So I feel like it's really developing and it's doing good. Okay. Yeah. And as a mainlander in China, yeah. do you feel at home over here because there's a huge community, Chinese community? Yes. Um, to be honest, I'm not very familiar with, with them, but I know some history. Like a few couple hundred years ago, some of Chinese people, they immigrate to Southeast Asia. And I just feel that's amazing because I can still say even if I'm like outside of my country, but I can still see some Chinese um, cultures, food, Chinese faces, languages on the street. So I feel it's a, it's a good place for us to travel. No, not that, like, we don't have that much language barrier in here, so yeah. Thank you, you too. <laughs> Today, the city comprises a mixture of old colonial influences, Asian traditions, Malay-Islamic inspirations, modern and postmodern architecture. 
It's this combination of different architectural styles, the old and the new, that makes Kuala Lumpur so photogenic. For example, Kuala Lumpur Railway Station was completed in 1917 and it was designed by British architect Arthur Benison Hubbock. He was able to incorporate the unique Anglo-Asian architecture in the design of the station. Let's talk to some locals. Are you guys Malay? Yeah, I'm a Malay. And how many languages do you speak? I speak two as a Malay, yeah. Most, of, most Malays we speak two, we're bilingual, so we speak Malay, Bahasa Melayu, and of course we speak English, um, our second language, basically. It's interesting how you mentioned it's a melting pot, and are all ethnicities getting along well? Yeah, actually, surprisingly, if you check the shop next to you, it's a Muslim shop, but Chinese people go there, even Indian people go there. So, okay. Yeah, it's actually... So it is like a melting pot? It is a melting pot, basically. <laughs> you also like Chinese food and Indian food? Mostly everything, yeah. Indians in the morning, Chinese in the evening, and maybe <laughs> Malays for dinner. Anytime, 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 anytime anywhere. Anytime. <laughs> Supper, breakfast, anytime. Right. Yeah. All right, thanks guys. Ah, you're no welcome. Problem. Kuala Lumpur has been named the best city in the world for foreign workers numerous times, mainly because of its great work and life balance and for the friendliness of its citizens. Where do you guys come from? I'm from India. Nice to meet you. Oh, thank you. And how long have you lived in Kuala Lumpur? I was uh, 13 years now. Wow, 13 years. Yes. And how do you like it so far? Uh, good, very good. And um, this country is uh, very good nature and climate, people's food. Yes. That's so the main, food. right? <laughs> yes, that's a good thing. And, and what do you this, do for work? Uh, I'm just doing here uh, engineering uh, in oil and gas. I'm working. And the pay rate in Kuala Lumpur, it's uh, competitive, right, on, on the world scale? That's what I told. Uh, what award you are getting, how much you are spending here, that's what oh, okay. the thing. It depends. Right. In Dubai, if you get more, but you have to spend more. Oh, Singapore, okay. you have to get more, spend more. Okay. But here, you're getting less, you spend less, that's it. <laughs> it's okay. okay. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. Oh, actually, because you come from India, right? Yes. And there's a huge Indian community here. Yep. Do you stay in touch with them? Uh, I'm staying little in India, little India, oh, where my uh, yes, yes. Okay. This, uh, so you almost feel at home. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what makes Kuala Lumpur such a great city? It's great for expats to work and live in because of its well-developed infrastructure and low cost of living. Many foreigners choose a neighborhood downtown or near it, where you'll find monthly rent in the range of six hundred to a thousand dollars for a nice furnished one to two bedroom apartment in a serviced condominium. Most buildings are modern and spacious. The living areas are open plan and most contain floor to ceiling windows, allowing for year round sunshine to beam through. The property prices are among the cheapest in Southeast Asia. The city is expanding fast and construction is everywhere. What about economy? In 2019, the city's GDP was 60 billion, which is $31,000 per capita. Not bad. You'll be surprised to see local car brands like Proton. What are the salaries like? A teacher starting salaries around $450 and can go well over a thousand a month. A taxi driver makes around $300 to $700. Not a lot, I know, but there's a lot of competition. Expats normally make in the range of $2,000 and $3,000 a month. Which is great considering how inexpensive everything is. Basically anything above $1,000 a month is considered a good salary here. Tipping is not common practice and most restaurants will simply apply a service charge directly to your bill. I saw a few homeless people here and there. Currently there are around 1,400 homeless people living on the streets of Kuala Lumpur. And sometimes things get a little bit out of control. Wow, what a contrast. Looking at this, I reckon there's a little bit of income inequality. No way these guys bought these cars working regular 9 to 5 jobs. Nice rides. If you love shopping, you're gonna love it here. 
The city houses some of the world's largest shopping malls, such as Pavilion Mall. It's called a shopping paradise by many locals. It's a multiple award-winning shopping mall with 700 stores spread over 10 floors and with an enormous food court. It's located in Bukit Bintan, the shopping and entertainment center of Kuala Lumpur. Welcome to the Times Square of Kuala Lumpur and that's the area around Pavilion Mall. There are many other shopping malls in the city, like Surya KLCC inside the Twin Towers and Berjaya Times Square Shopping Mall, one of the largest in the world. The most popular area to experience the thriving nightlife of Kuala Lumpur is Bukit Bintan, which I just mentioned. And it's a party place in Kuala Lumpur. <laughs> <laughs> There's an array of hot spots and it has something to offer for yeah. everyone from relaxed lounges, electrifying dance floors to street performances. How's it going guys? That's a busy place. I think this heavy rain scared away all the customers because it's pretty empty right now. How you doing? Welcome to Pacific Vlog! Hi hi! Hi hi! We're just walking around. Hi vlog! go a little further there's this place that has a lot of massage parlors Hello, massage. how's everybody doing <laughs> how's it going bro <laughs> massage go, go right. inside because Lin okay <laughs> That's a lot of massage places. More massage. More massage. If you get hungry, I have a recommendation for you. Jalan Alor Food Street. This street is a bustling food hub. Come here to enjoy Chinese, Thai and Malaysian cuisine. Seafood, skewers, exotic fruit, including durians of course. You want some durian? That's the place to come to. Oh, king of the fruit. Nutty taste. And at the same time, I don't know, it's just combinations of everything, but it's very sweet. And I love it. And they say it's good for you. <laughs> How's your coconut? <laughs> Walk around and enjoy the atmosphere, and then get some food and have a good time. And this is a pigeon. And this one is frog. Superman. Superman frog. Used to be Superman, now it's barbecue. <laughs> this place is massive and it offers so many choices. Any kind of cuisine you can find here. Are you buying this one? Yeah. This one? Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> Now let's visit the major sites of the city. The Batu Caves are one of the country's biggest tourist attractions. On the way to Batu Caves, you'll see the area where the original tin mines were located in the 19th century. The Batu Caves are located within a high limestone outcropping, a colossal gold-plated statue of Murugan, the Hindu god of war made from reinforced concrete and 2.7 meters in height, stands near the base of a flight of 272 steps. As visitors climb the steps, they are frequently bothered by macaques begging aggressively for food. At the top of the steps you'll find the entrance to the largest cave called Cathedral Cave or Temple Cave. Yeah, this is one of the most sacred temples in Hinduism. Lord Morgan, who is a deity in Hinduism, 
her followers came here from South India and built this cave, or didn't build this cave, sorry. They built this temple in this cave. Um, and it's to also remember Lord Morgan's defeat over the demon lord and how good will always prevail over evil. Another cave nearby, Ramayana Cave, has an entrance marked with the statue of the monkey god Hanuman, hero of the Indian epic poem Ramayana. Of course, if you love history, it's a good idea to visit the National Museum. It showcases the Malaysian history from the early human migration to the present day. You can learn about Malaysia's aboriginals, the birth of the Malay state, and how several centuries of colonialism made the country what it is today. Minara Kuala Lumpur, or simply KL Tower, is a 421 meter tall telecommunications tower the seventh tallest tower in the world. Its construction was completed in 1994. There's a nice observation deck at the height of 335 meters. And this is the view you're gonna get from KL Tower from the sky deck. The city was founded on the side of the jungle and it still feels like a city in the jungle up to this day. Perdana Botanical Gardens is a great escape from the hustle and bustle of the city. So the botanical garden is like jungle in the middle of the city. It contains large sculpted and manicured gardens and a host of attractions like a deer park, hibiscus garden, bird park and butterfly park. Wow, what a view guys. This is Perdana Botanical Gardens and it's the first large scale recreation park in Kuala Lumpur. It was founded all the way in 1888 during the colonial times and it's sitting right in the heart of the city. Fantastic. This place used to be an old market square and it, as you can tell it's surrounded by all these historical buildings and what I like about Kuala Lumpur is that everything's kind of mixed you know you see the brand new sky rises standing side by side with these historical buildings and this wonderful clock tower in the middle that's pretty cool this beautiful area is called the river of life you wonder why because it's going to take a whole river of water for me to survive in these hard temperatures. This is the National Mosque of Malaysia. The building was completed in 1965 and it's mostly noted for its tall minaret, 73 meters tall, and also the roof that looks like a 16-pointed star. Ooh, it's much better now. The main roof is reminiscent of an open umbrella and the minaret's cap is reminiscent of a folded one. Next on the list is Thien Ho Temple. This is Thien Ho Temple. It was constructed in 1987. It was built by a Chinese person living in Malaysia. It's an incredibly beautiful six-tired temple dedicated to the Chinese sea goddess Matsu. It's located on 1.6 acres of land atop Robson Heights. It was officially opened in 1989. It's one of the largest temples in Southeast Asia. Great views of the city and you'll find many Chinese couples get married, which is lovely. Wow, that's a nice neighborhood. Central Market is a popular place for shopping. Central Market, in operation since 1888. It's nice to have a modern air-conditioned shopping experience to get away from the heat. Shops range from cheap touristy places to nicer boutiques. <laughs> Jamek Mosque. This mosque was designed by Arthur Benison Habeck and is also referred to as Friday Mosque by the locals. And it was constructed in 1909, so it's been here for more than 100 years. Now, the very city of Kuala Lumpur was founded in 1857, so it was there from the very beginning. 
very unique architectural style, Mughal, Indian Islamic architectural style. I think it's pretty cool. Big white domes. And of course, you can't ignore the new kid on the block. Wow, what's this, guys? This is the second tallest tower in the world. It's called Wairisan Merdeka Tower. Matter of fact, the height is 679 meters. So it's the second tallest building after Burj Khalifa. And it's known as KL-118 because it has 118 floors. It will be opened in June 2024. Three. So right now it's closed. You can also visit KLCC Aquarium. However, in my view, it's pretty average. The underwater tunnel is cool, but overall the place feels a little bit run down and it doesn't offer anything compared to new and modern aquariums around the world. KL is growing fast and to help ease the congestion, many of the federal offices were moved to the city of Putrajaya, about 25 kilometers south of Kuala Lumpur. Putrajaya subsequently became the country's administrative center, while Kuala Lumpur remains the capital and the cultural, financial and economic center of Malaysia. It is home to the Parliament of Malaysia and the Istana Negara, the official residence of the monarch of Malaysia. Wow, beautiful flowers. Oh, right now we're actually at the National Palace of Malaysia. And you guys want to know how the political system is set up here? So you have 14 provinces all together, none of which are ruled by sultanates, where power goes from father to son. And the other five are ruled by uh, governors who are elected by popular vote. So out of those nine sultans, they all take turns to become the king of the country for five years, and then they keep rotating. So the king resides in this palace for five years. So there you have it, guys. Kuala Lumpur, a city that makes luxury affordable. Thanks for watching this video, guys. If you liked it, give me a thumbs up and I'll see you in my next video. So Duncan, yeah. have you ever been to China? I have never been to China, seriously. It's quite, quite sad for me. <laughs> Are you quite planning sad. on going? Next year. Next, next year? year? Next year. Oh, cool, I plan cool. to bring my parents to visit. Uh, my ancestors, I um, mean, the, the, the previously they born over there. Uh, so really? Previously, they, they were from uh, China, Guangzhou, Shenzhen. Oh, really? I plan to bring my parents to there. So, southern and China. Visit, and visit the, the relatives over there. You, you guys planning. still stay in touch? We still keep in touch. Wow. We still keep in touch with them. But they speak Cantonese in south of China? Uh, they speak Cantonese and my own uh, language, Hakka. They can are still able to communicate with us that that easily. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Until now, be... so glad we still communicate with them. That would be a great yeah. family uh, reunion, right? Yeah.